Who shit is that? It's my shit. Oh shit. You edit them. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, what's going on with your gang? It's your boy, Deuce the Reaper, back at it again with another banger. Today, we got that murder mystery, dog. Uh, part three. You feel me? Part three. Part three. Ah, part one and two went crazy. Part one and two went crazy. And I appreciate y'all so much for that. For real. The love. But let's do this, man. Let's do this. Let's, uh... Let's say this. Let's do 30 likes, 15 comments, and I'll drop part four. Yeah, 30 likes, 15 comments. Do that shit right now. And I don't I don't want spam comments. I want comments from different people, you feel me? We got the twist of tea. Y'all y'all niggas don't know about this shit though. Hey. Um, how many of y'all hitting a nigga with a twist of tea? <clears throat> Man, how many of y'all did that? Or just... Or how many of y'all seen that? Nigga, make the whole fucking can explode on your, on his chin. Whoa. <laughs> he need a new jaw. Goddamn. Crack this shit open. I can do that way. That shit's starting to rise. He said that shit's starting to rise. But nah, let's, let's get right up into this uh, murder mystery. You know, I, it's a perfect time for him. It's a perfect time for him. So let's get used to him. That shit. That shit. Debbie Ann Dudley Davis was yeah, born in Lynchburg, Virginia on July 15th of 19... Yeah, we go. We get right over to this. We get right over to this. Debbie Ann Dudley Davis was born in Lynchburg, Virginia on July 15th of 1952. She had a brief marriage after school that ended in divorce. Debbie then followed her cousin, Judy Fisk, to Richmond, Virginia and moved into an apartment on Devonshire Street in the Westover Hills neighborhood. Debbie started working as Style Weekly's accounts manager in 1985. They are a media outlet based in Richmond. Debbie was a pop culture fan who enjoyed Bruce Springsteen records. She was an extra in the HBO movie Finnegan Begin. Debbie was a redhead. Debbie was a redhead. I look like Debbie off of the little Debbie cake. Uh, Man. Debbie cake brand. Give her some pigtails, call her Wendy's. Ooh. Again, Debbie was an avid mystery novel reader. She worked a couple nights a week at the Walden Bookstore at Cloverleaf Mall in Chesterfield County. On the evening of September 18th of 1987, Debbie and her co-worker Deanna Hope took a road trip to Virginia Beach. They went to see a performance by Dana Carvey. After the show, Deanna dropped Debbie at her apartment and waited to drive off until she was safely inside. Little did Deanna know, this would be the last time she ever- Hey, I be doing that. I be waiting till niggas get inside. Cool. Get inside, oh yeah, God. Yeah, you feel me, like... Yeah. Nigga, that's, that's what you gotta do, though, like... Because anything can happen in that split mm -hmm. second. As anything. soon as you pull off, take them lights off the house, everything. Man, it's over with. It's over with. They put something over your fucking mouth. Wrap that, like, nigga, squeeze that shit. You know me, I be... I be gone. Music glasses, I ain't gonna hear nothing. High as hell, he gonna be... <laughs> <laughs> Man. <laughs> oh, God. Nigga, that shit crazy. Nah, but, yeah, you gotta, you gotta make sure your dog get up in the crib. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. Shit, always. Saw Debbie again. The next morning, a man named Arnold Ellis saw a Renault Alliance parked in front of his house. He noticed the motor was running. The keys were in the ignition, and there was no sign of the car's driver. Arnold Ellis then called the police. 
Police officers determined that the car belonged to Debbie Davis. She lived one street over from Arnold Ellis. A police officer knocked on Debbie's door but got no response. An elderly neighbor then came to give the officer a key. Inside, the officer saw Debbie's body face down on her bed. She was topless, wearing only a pair of cut-off jean shorts. Her right arm was tied behind her back with thick boot laces. Debbie's left arm was tied beneath her. The perpetrator tightly twisted a black sock around her neck. She had been strangled and assaulted. That must have been a long-ass sock. That must have been a dress sock. Like... Around her or neck. One of them uh, or one of them thick ass socks, thick ass long socks. Around her neck though. You'll be crazy. You'll be surprised what you could do with a sock. <laughs> Me what? Hell no. You'll yeah. be surprised what you could do with a sock, bro. That shit is crazy. Uh, and yeah. then and then to, to make it crazier, he took he took the lace off the boot. <laughs> he really like, he really, like, boom, kicked her. It was all like, hold on. No, he was like this. <laughs> took his boot off. Took his sock off. Oh. <laughs> Nigga. <laughs> so, so you say he used his own sock off his own foot? Oh, Nigga. Yeah, yeah. Cause if you got laces that's that fucking long to tie up both, nigga, <laughs> tie the bitch up with her with his shoelace. <laughs> with his shoelace, that's crazy. Bruh. Investigators discovered that the perpetrator stole a rocking chair from a nearby porch and propped it up outside Debbie's he kitchen to. window to gain entrance. Right. Next yeah. to Debbie's Sock bed on her nightstand was a mystery novel she had been reading called "Presumed in." <laughs> Nigga just carried a sock in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> hey, just imagine the other way though. Nigga just take off his boot, take off his sock, right in front of the bitch. Nick. Like, bitch, I'm about to, <laughs> <laughs> like, bitch, I'm about to kill your ass with this sock, bitch. <laughs> hey, come, up, come up in there. Boom! Big ass boot. <laughs> Take the lace off, nigga. Got the long ass lace, nigga. Take the boot off. Take the sock off, nigga. Long ass sock. Nigga, nigga long ass sock. Just, just strangling her with the sock, nigga. Hey, it ain't funny, but it's hey, crazy. Nigga, my feet is clean. That shit no crazy. That shit is crazy. Kill him with the sock. He said, he said, hold on, bitch. <laughs> Take the boot off. Take nigga. the boot off. Imagine her cracking her with the boot. <laughs> she trying to get back up. <laughs> Steal the hole. Boom. <laughs> she just. It was about a woman who was tied up and then her life was taken. Investigators knew the perpetrator was smart and most likely experienced. He left no fingerprints, there were no witnesses, and nothing had been taken as far as investigators could tell. Detective Ray Williams said, very seldom does a crook do that kind of damage and spend that much time with his victim and not leave a bunch of clues, but he left nothing. Lorna Wyckoff, the founder of Style Weekly, posted a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Investigators looked at people in Debbie's life to see if anyone stood out, but found nothing. Debbie led a quiet life. Debbie was not dating anyone, she had not seen her ex-husband in years, and she did not use drugs and did not hang out in bars. Just two weeks after Debbie's life was ended, tragedy would strike again in Richmond, Virginia. Susan Elizabeth Hellams was born on February 6th of 1955 in Charleston, South Carolina. She moved to Richmond, Virginia to work on her residency in neurosurgery at the Medical College of Virginia. 
Susan married Marcel Slag and bought a house in... Whoa. Smart. She's smart. Hella smart. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Not, not like that. That's crazy or anything, but like... She was on her shit. Like, you could still be... You could still be out the way. You could still be hit. Like, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, like, getting at, like. She was smart. She was doing her thing. She was out the way. Like, out the way as much as motherfucking possible. Quiet life. Like, how much more out the way can you be? Like, nigga. Just look at her. That's wild. Like, what the fuck? And you end up still dying. Earl. <coughs> That's crazy. Tranquil Woodland Heights neighborhood in Richmond. On October 3rd of 1987, Marcel pulled up to their house at 1.45 a.m. As he entered the house, he could hear her moving around upstairs. Marcel knew she had worked late and thought he might have woken her up. He quickly took a shower and silently crept into their dark bedroom. As his eyes adjusted to the darkness, he could make out a sight from a horror movie. His wife's partially nude body laying half out of their bedroom closet. A red leather belt was around her neck. Susan's hands had been bound tightly behind her back with an extension cord and necktie. Just like Debbie, Susan had been assaulted and strangled. Marcel saw their bedroom window was wide open. Their house was a little less than a mile away from Debbie Davis's house. Detective Ray Williams was on duty that night and was ordered to work. And the cops ain't, nigga, where the, where the cops at? Nigga, they're, they're still trying to solve Debbie shit. You know? They not on. They not on it enough to notice the other girl shit. Like nigga, if you niggas was on your shit, you would notice. Like they eat donuts. Like nigga, they eat donuts. Oh god. Donut ass eat niggas. Okay. It's a nigga though. Man, if it's He's a nigga, gone. they all, man. They blame everybody until they find that nigga. Death sins. Man. You, you see that one in W. Millie shit? shit. He, wa he wasn't even... You see even, that Donald Trump shit? Man. That shit he crazy. out running for president. That's crazy. Let a nigga though. I bet you if that was Barack Obama. Both cases. Williams said that the perpetrator was still in the house when Marcel right, arrived yeah. home. He heard somebody Stop. upstairs. Really it couldn't have been Susan. She was already gone. On the balcony outside the window, investigators found an open Vaseline jar left by the perpetrator. <laughs> they traced its purchase to a store adjacent to nearby Cloverleaf Mall. Hey. Hey. <laughs> hey, what the fuck? <laughs> Yo, nigga, he brought Vaseline. <laughs> hey, man. What? That nigga got Vaseline. That nigga got busy. He said, he said. <laughs> he said. Oh, God. <laughs> he got busy. <laughs> Nigga brought the Vaseline. He said a leather belt. He said. <laughs> <laughs> nigga. This nigga is using everything on his body. <laughs> he said a necktie. He said. <laughs> Tied her hands with a necktie. And an extension cord. Extension cord. He probably cord. found it in the house. <laughs> Man. Michael Myers. Said. What? On the balcony outside the window, investigators found an open Vaseline jar left by the perpetrator. They traced its purchase to a store adjacent to nearby Cloverleaf Mall. 
The lead was followed, but led to nowhere. Realizing a serial offender is in their midst, the community erupted into fear. They demanded action from the police. Williams worked tirelessly for days and finally, he did find a clue that could potentially be useful. When he looked through the financial records at the Cloverleaf Mall Walden bookstore where Debbie worked part time, he found a check written by Susan and endorsed on the back by Debbie. Williams wasn't sure if this was just a coincidence or if it was a possible link between the two crimes. As Detective Williams pondered this question, yet another horrendous crime took place in the Richmond area. Diane Cho was born in Korea in 1972. She and her family immigrated to the United States in 1984. On 1987, 15-year-old Diane was a freshman at Manchester High School. She was very smart and took care of virtually everything for her parents who barely spoke English. In October of 1987, Diane told one of her friends about a disturbing, recurring nightmare she had been having. Diane kept having dreams about an unknown man following her. She also told her friends at school that she sometimes saw this unknown man from her dreams at the mall. One night in November of night. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Because, like, my pops passed away and shit when I was four and shit, right? So, like, when I was, like, around, what, 13, not even 13, I want to say, like, 11, 12, I had reoccurring dreams and shit about, like, people chasing me and, 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 and uh, trying to catch me and shit. And my pops would, like, always, like, redirect me in, like, uh, like, hiding spots and shit, places to hide in, you feel me? And, like, you know how you, like, go to sleep, wake up, go to sleep, and, like, you'll, like, have different dreams and shit? No, that dream would, like, when I when I went to sleep and I woke up, let me put it like this. Say if I woke up and I went right back to sleep, yeah. my dream would start off from that same spot. He went to sleep and then woke back up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would start where it ended. Start right back up. And then, like, and that's when I was, like, walking to uh, school and shit. And then I started taking different routes when I uh, started having them dreams. And that's when, um, well, once I started taking different routes, that's when I stopped having them dreams. Oh, yeah. Mm. That shit's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's like it. It's like he was like telling me something. Mm -hmm. That's dreams. Dreams are are definitely a fucking message. Are definitely a message. Cause your mom, your mom won't have a dream about a baby. And mm -hmm. what? And what? You having a baby on the way? A motherfucker be having a baby on the way. Mm -hmm. Type shit. You feel me? No, that is crazy. Like. Bro, that shit's hella wild. Dreams is just a message. This is what I'm getting at. You mm -hmm. It is. Hey, if niggas know, niggas know. For real. Some niggas gonna be knowing. Some niggas be like, yeah, what? This is a dream, bro. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can't think of it like that. Can't think of it like that. Man, I have. <laughs> That's crazy ass dreams. 1987, Diane went to the Cloverleaf Mall Theater with a friend. They bought tickets for the Princess Bride. She then began trembling with fright and pointed out her stalker, who was staring at them from the parking lot. It had been barely five months since Diane's family moved to Richmond, where her parents worked long hours running a convenience store near Virginia Commonwealth University. It's not known. If Diane ever told her parents about the encounter with the unknown man at the Cloverleaf Mall. On the night of November 21st of 1987, Diane's parents arrived home to their apartment around 9. Diane's mother then gave her a haircut. As they went to bed around midnight, they could hear Diane typing out an English paper in her bedroom across the hall. The next day... Diane's parents called home around 2 p.m. to remind their children to get ready for an afternoon church service. Diane's 12-year-old brother, Roman, 
answered the phone. Diane was still asleep, and he did not want to anger her by waking her up. Diane's parents arrived home about an hour later, and her mother went straight to Diane's bedroom and opened the door. Diane's mom then screamed loudly. Diane was tied up with rope. She had been strangled and assaulted, and her bedroom window was open. You can clearly see the pattern of... Nigga. Hold on. Hold on. Because he has his finisher down. <laughs> he has his finisher down. Pat. That's a special move. <laughs> Man. Open the bedroom window. <laughs> Get right up out that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Do his thing. <laughs> You're right about that bitch. Bro, it's like... Next it's, house. It's like a routine. Just sitting pe sitting in the bushes waiting for the next house. Bro, you know how... And right up in that bitch. You know how shit just be on like replay? Go up the stairs and shit. Nigga, <laughs> <laughs> go up in the room. <laughs> Nick, what the crock? <laughs> Some crazy ass shit, nigga. Man, that shit would be crazy. Whoa. Some Mortal Kombat shit. Whoa, in the eye socket, that'd be wild. Nah, that. He got his little. Get the little charger in there. <laughs> Sick, get the get him with the charger. <laughs> oh, no. Crazy. Nigga. What? Yeah. Grab your, nah. grab your shoes. Keep your windows locked. Oh, God. Like, Keep your bro. windows locked. Bro. <sighs> what? Well, Washington. Washington have motherfucking serial killers all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. Mm -hmm. Motherfuckers trying to be serial killers. Motherfuckers trying to do they, 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 they own thing. You feel me? Like trying to be they own serial killer. Without oh, yeah. even trying to be a serial killer, oh, God. they think that shit normal. You feel me? Like that's just not normal. Um, but even motherfuckers up in Washington and shit, like y'all especially gotta lock y'all y'all windows. Make sure your shit is locked. Even if you're on the third floor, motherfuckers be having their own ladders. Bro, climb right up in your shit. Climb right up in your shit. Man, act, acted like a uh, construction worker. Crazy. Have a whole van and everything. Crazy. But Man. they would have caught that nigga if he was like doing shit like that. Because if you if you repeatedly going around with <laughs> a van and construction <laughs> shit, they're gonna no, definitely. No, no, you could that. be like you could be like construction, motherfucking uh, Cause, pest control. You could do but, different things with a with a whole white van. You could do different things. But, but they gonna tag that white van. They gonna be like, that's that white van. How they gonna know it's that white van? Cause man, if it's hitting off, if if, it, if you know where that no, white no, van you is, right, you right though. If it's hitting off, because like, if you know where that white van is to tag it off, you know who who, who the uh, the killer is. No, yeah, you right. You just gotta follow him. Mm -hmm. But sometimes. Like, they just don't be on that shit like that. Exactly. Like, uh, what's his name? But he didn't say it was like a construction worker, though. What's his name? What's his name? What's that nigga name? But they do be doing shit like that. That was eating, eating kids and shit. Who? Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. Like Jeffrey Dahmer, right? White dude. He lived up in the projects, though. And they wasn't looking for no white dude that was doing them killings. They was looking for a black dude. It's the same fucking thing. I'm telling you, man. Telling you. Telling you. All the crimes, it would happen again Shit for crazy. the fourth time. 44-year-old Sue Tucker lived in Arlington County, Ain't Virginia no in November of 1987. She was an editor for a department of agriculture magazine. Her husband, Reg Tucker, was a former photographer for the Fairfax County <laughs> Public Schools. Reg had taken a job as a photography teacher in his native country of Wales in early 1987. Sue was preparing the couple's home for sale and winding down her projects at work as she planned to join her husband in Wales. Ironically, 
They wanted to immigrate because of an increase in violence in the United States. They were worried about crime. A neighbor of the couple, Audrey Sizelove, had been unable to reach Sue for a few days and noticed that Sue's bedroom window had been open for days. When you Audrey know. tried to enter <laughs> no, the home here. to check on her friend, you know she you smelled did. an odor like rotting flesh. She called the police, who arrived and found Sue's badly decomposing body laid out across her bed. She had been tightly bound in nylon ropes. Whoa. I, I want to make shit clear, first of all. We ain't laughing at the shit that, that, that's going on. We laughing at the shit that, like, what, what we imagine. You feel me? Like, that went on. Like, nigga, this shit is, this shit is hell fucked up. Oh, God. Like, that shit's crazy. Four bodies, bro. Four. That's crazy. He just kicking in every door, like. Imagine if it's a net like bro that that is crazy though like cause this shit is real He's life. He's really like, like kick dough. For this shit sure. is real life on oh, God. That nigga was on some Michael Myers shit. On me. Bro, like He was on some crazy like some strangler shit. On me. Like this sounds like some uh, he probably look actually look like the strangler some movie off, shit. That nigga probably looked like the strangler off of SpongeBob. <laughs> the hash like oh no, that the nigga that strangler that, nigga. That, <laughs> that big I'm gonna truck. strangle you. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Just strangle you. Yeah, that shit yeah. crazy. No, nah, but But that shit is that shit is crazy. That's like that's actual people's lives and shit. Like mm -hmm. this nigga It's gone. Oh god, he just he just playing with people's lives. Like he just on some weird shit. Just taking them. Crazy. Strangled and assaulted. In her there were no fingerprints. Right. The perpetrator no had broken in through a small basement laundry room window. Before leaving, he had taken the time to fix a snack. He discarded a partially eaten orange on the Tucker's dining room table. While investigators were inside... Niggas <laughs> disrespectful! Yo, he's... He's... He's a... That was a real, like... It's crazy because there's really niggas out here like that, bro. Like, just psychopaths. Like, nigga, go straight up to your fridge. And face the snack. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that shit is crazy. That, that nigga was up in there. Sandwich. That nigga was up in there. <laughs> no, like, he really opened the fridge he, and he was, like, just chilling. Like, what's there to eat? <laughs> he really said. He said. <laughs> Really like, look over your email, <laughs> bro. He, he really like cut up the the the, the tomatoes, the lettuce. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! You know he was cutting it like this, bro. If he made some top ramen up in there, like really like sat there and waited until the water boiled oh and god. everything. While he eating the sandwich, he just he just he eating the sandwich, he just. <laughs> to make matters worse, they said they said her shit, was, her body was rotting. on God, so he was up in there making a snack. He was nigga Bro, probably so watching Netflix. Was he going back for like groceries and shit? <laughs> he was probably he's probably out of there by then. He probably didn't stay that long. On oh God, like, what if he was like going back for like groceries and shit though? <sighs> Like, nah, damn, that TV He's on to nice. the next vis victim, though. Yeah. Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah. You right, you right, you right. That shit's crazy. That's how that shit... That's crazy. That shit is hella crazy. And assaulted. There were no fingerprints. The no perpetrator fingers. had broken in through a small basement laundry room window. Yeah. Before leaving, <laughs> he had taken the time to fix a snack. He discarded a partially eaten orange on the Tucker's dining room table. While investigators were inside the house, the telephone rang. It was Reg Tucker. The last few days he had been trying to reach Sue. Police officers had to give him the horrible news. 
Arlington investigators who were assigned to the case realized the crime was very similar to the one that took place in January of 1984. Yeah. It was then that 32-year-old attorney Carolyn Ham was slain. Her body had been found not far from Sue Tucker's home. David Vasquez, a fast food worker with a low IQ, had confessed to that crime and was serving a 35-year prison sentence for it. If he was in prison, why were there identical crimes being committed almost four years later? Arlington County Detective Joe Horgus was the lead investigator on Sue Tucker's case. He traveled to the prison to interview David Vasquez because the modus operandi was the same. The hands tied behind the back, rope around the neck, and they were both assaulted. After the interview, it was clear to the detective that Vasquez was not at all involved with what happened to Sue. As investigators in both Arlington County and Richmond investigated their cases, they noticed something. Just like Richmond had a serial offender attacking women in their homes in 1987, Arlington County had their own maniac in 1983 and 1984. It all started in Arlington in June of 1983 with the abduction and assault of a woman in the county's Green Valley area by a knife-wielding black man in his late teens or early 20s wearing a homemade mask. Over the next seven months, as his attacks escalated, he abducted women in their cars and entered their houses and apartments through unlocked windows. He relentlessly assaulted and brutalized nine women. He tied some of them up with nylon cords cut from their Venetian blinds. Former Arlington County Commonwealth's attorney Halen Fahey was quoted as saying he was a one-person crime wave. In January of 1984, an Arlington woman came home to discover evidence from an unsettling break-in. The cords of her Venetian blinds had been cut and were laid out on her bed. The intruder left the house. It seemed like he was there waiting for her to come home and got tired of waiting. It was four days after that that Carolyn Ham was found bound and strangled in her garage. Arlington police arrested David Vasquez and charged him with taking her life. Vasquez did not match the description that any of the assault victims gave, but the crimes in the area did stop. It was only after Sue Tucker's slaying that investigators learned the perpetrator of all the assaults was definitely not Vasquez and the unknown man took a brief hiatus and then continued his attacks in Richmond. Detective Horgus received a teletype from Richmond police where they described the identical strangulations of Debbie Davis Susan Hellams, and Diane Cho. After sharing all the information, investigators concluded it was the same man responsible for all the crimes, perhaps even Carolyn Ham <laughs> slain. The investigation stalled for another few agonizing weeks while they hoped for a break in the case before the strangler could take another life. Investigators looked at the timeline of the crimes. Many of them took place in 1983 to 1984 and then continued in 1987. The FBI felt that the perpetrator would not have stopped his attacks of his own volition. It was likely that he had been jailed for another offense between the slayings of Carolyn Ham and Debbie Davis. As detectives tried to think about possible suspects, one of them thought of Tommy Spencer. He was a teenager that was arrested for burglary during the mid-1970s. Investigators discovered that Spencer had been arrested in January of 1984 for break-ins in neighboring Alexandria. He had been paroled to a halfway house in Richmond in 1987 right before Debbie's life was taken. Investigators went to the halfway house. They found that Spencer signed himself out on every evening a crime took place. He got a furlough to go to Arlington on the day that Sue Tucker's life was taken. Investigators decided to put Spencer under surveillance. They wanted to catch him in the act of doing something incriminating. Over two weeks, plainclothes Richmond police officers observed Spencer committing parole violations, like spending the night at his girlfriend's house. They were intrigued to find that he would hang out for hours at Cloverleaf Mall. As you remember, the mall had strong ties to Debbie Davis, Susan Hellams, and Diane Cho. On January 20th of 1988, Arlington and Richmond detectives took Spencer into custody and took a sample of his blood. 
Without witnesses or fingerprints, or any other direct evidence tying Spencer to the crimes, law enforcement had to rely on a brand new forensic science method called DNA fingerprinting. At that stage, it has only been used in one cold case in the United Kingdom and never before in the United States. It was the case of Linda Mann and Don Ashworth. It would take more than six weeks, but a private lab in New York would report back that Spencer's DNA had been matched to male DNA at the crime scenes of Debbie Davis, Dr. Susan Hellams, Susan Tucker, and assault victims in Arlington and Richmond. Timothy Spencer was the man who had become known as the Southside Strangler. He went to trial in July of 1988. After a six-day trial, he was found guilty. It was the first conviction based on DNA evidence in the United States. Spencer... What's, what is wrong with you? I know you did. What is wrong with you? No, matter of fact, you ain't even up there. What is wrong with you? Oh, God. What is wrong <laughs> with you, nigga? Like, what the fuck? What? The self size strangler? Yeah. Since he was a teenager, though. That's crazy. Like... That's crazy. He's given multiple life sentences. What about Carolyn Ham and David Vasquez, you ask? Why was he found guilty of the crime if he didn't match the description that was given by victims of any other crime in the area? David Vasquez first became a suspect in that case because Carolyn complained that he was peeping on her while she was sunbathing in the week leading up to her demise. With his low IQ, it was easy for investigators to get a false confession out of him. They revealed all of the details to him, and he parroted it back to them. After DNA linked Timothy Spencer to all the other crimes, investigators were seriously doubting that Vasquez was involved. DNA soon proved it as well, and David was released. David became known as the first person in the United States that was exonerated thanks to DNA. Shortly before 11 p.m. on Wednesday, April 27th of 1994, Timothy Wilson Spencer was strapped into Virginia's sturdy oak and electric chair dubbed Old Sparky at Greensville Correctional Center and was executed. <laughs> Old Sparky. <laughs> and they hit him with the Old Sparky. <laughs> Sparky hit his ass. That's gotta crazy. Do gotta do him with that shit. Sparky made it slap, slap. Imagine if that shit. Imagine if Sparky that shit. Sparky made it spark, spark, spark. Imagine if that shit played while he was getting electrocuted. Sparky made it spark, spark, spark. <laughs> hey, he got what was coming to him. Bad nine, nine of the days. No, it's more though because. Oh yeah. The ones after that. Oh yeah. It was nine. I think it was nine when he was like a teenager. He was going crazy. Buck wild. Mm -mm -mm. Only bringing a stop to the horrendous crime spree. Oh, shit. You made this far, like, come and share. And hit that sub button, man. Hit that sub button, man. It's a whole lot of janky stuff that be going on in the world.